once you've marked their songbooks, I want you to think about this, and uh, and I don't want to pick on my uh, on my uh, editor too much, but uh, you know, you'll notice here on the uh, on the oh, my battery's even dead on the on the slide the uh, the sling here. We know that is a sling shot, um, but we are we're studying David today. And in this phase of David, where we're looking at David and Goliath. Now, this was not the type of slingshot that was used. The sling, we sing a song, and that, that song reminds us of the type of slingshot. You know, David took those stones and he put it in, the sling went round and round. So it was a slingshot that was, was different from the one pictured. So again, not to pick on my editor too much, Kate, but... Uh, you know, wrong slingshot. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, where we're going to pick up our study of David. And again, I want to look at this uh, in, in, uh, in light of David, a man after God's own heart. And really the question should be asked, uh, why has this account of David and Goliath, why has this battle become a children's story? And can adults learn something from this account of David and Goliath? And I think that really is a question that you'll have to answer for yourself, but we look at this as a children's story, and sometimes it has it has become almost a almost a cartoon type character in this in this figure. But we need to look at this and see exactly what we can get out of this. I'm not going to read the entire 17th chapter of uh, 1 Samuel, uh, but what I want us to do is I want us to to lift a few points out of this chapter that might be helpful to us today. And I think that what, what will be helpful to us today is Israel had an enemy. The Philistine army is the enemy of Israel in, in today's lesson. The Philistine army has been a thorn in the side of Israel. We've been studying, we've been studying on Wednesday nights in the book of Genesis. You know, the Philistines argued with Abraham. King Abimelech was a Philistine. They also fought with Isaac a little bit. Not, not in the major way we're seeing today, but this Philistine army has been a, an enemy of, of old Israel for a long, long time. But you know, today we have enemies. We have giant enemies in our lives. You know, yours might be different from mine. Sometimes Sometimes financial burdens are the giants that we face. Sometimes a health condition is the giant that we face. Sometimes depression might be the giant we face. Sometimes maybe even financial burdens. Your, your enemy is different from my enemy. Your giant is different from my giant. But remember this, the father of all of our enemies... The captain of all of our enemies is Satan. We may be fighting different battles, but we're fighting the same war. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So, you know, really, David, as we look at this account, has a different enemy than we have. David could see his enemy. A lot of times, we cannot see our enemy. But that does not diminish the enemy that David fought. It does not diminish the enemy that we have. Our enemy is the same one that Jesus encountered. He was attacked by the same enemy we are attacked by. Matthew chapter 4, he was tempted by Satan, verses 1 through 11 of that chapter. We're not going to go there for time's sake. 
But Satan tempted him in every way known to man. He tempted him with hunger. He tempted him with lust. He tempted him with the, the every, every aspect of things. And Jesus was victorious. And we can be victorious as well. Now I want you to turn back in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we see here that David went out to meet his enemy. The first thing that I have discovered in battling a battle with an enemy. Not that I've been in military or anything like that. But you don't shrink from a fight. If you're fighting a giant in your life, don't shrink back from that giant. David, in verse 32 of chapter 17, went out to meet Goliath. And David said, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. All right, so we need to take a lesson from that. When we have an enemy, we need to rise up and face that enemy. David faced his enemy. Notice what is not happening here. We studied Saul two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we studied kings, or I guess maybe three weeks ago now, because this is the second lesson on David. We studied Saul. Saul is still king of Israel. He is still reigning over Israel. But I want you to notice what is not happening. The first thing I learned about leadership is that you have to lead. Saul is cowering in a tent. Whose place was it to lead the army of Israel into battle? In those days, the king led the battle. You know, really, our politicians today could take a lesson from this. I think we'd be in a whole lot better shape if, if Congress would actually lead the charge. You know, if our elected leaders would not simply uh, hide themselves away in the safety of, of places well secured. I think, you know, I, I knew a man one time, and, and it was through the farmer's market. He's an older gentleman by the name of Ozzy. And Ozzy taught me more about leadership than anyone else ever did. I was working construction on third, down on 3rd Street here in Marietta. And I, I saw Ozzy sweeping the, the sidewalk in front of what was then the Marietta Savings Bank. It's uh, Huntington Bank now, I believe. No. Not, I don't know, it's, it's still down there. It's not married to Savings Bank, but it was at that time when I was in my early 20s. I saw Ozzy, and I thought Ozzy had been retired for years. He's an old fellow, you know, older than Roy, you know, older than Dirk. So anyway, uh, you know, here's Ozzy. He's out there sweeping the sidewalk in front of the bank and doing a little landscape work. I said, hey, Ozzy, how you doing? He said, oh, I'm just fine. Got to get this wrapped up so I can go home. Uh, and it was, that's where I was headed. It was on my way home. And uh, I said, what'd you do? Get you a part-time job at the bank? He kind of chuckled. Well, I've been here for 40 years. He goes, and I found out he was the bank president. And I'm like, what in the world are you doing sleeping the sidewalk? And Ozzie said, you know, Tom, one thing I learned is you never ask someone to do a job that you're not willing to do yourself. And he went on to tell me that he had worked every, every position in that bank so that he could have a full understanding of what it was to be a bank teller, to be a loan officer, to be a vault security guy. He worked all those jobs. And that left an impression on me. That's what Saul is not. King Saul is not a leader. Saul's not fighting the Philistines. Oh, his tent's there, but it's back a little ways. He's securely surrounded by his, his guards and his army. He doesn't go forward. So I want you to notice that's not happening. Israel themselves are cowering. Goliath comes out and he shouts a challenge. I want you to notice with me in this. Um, in verse 19, 
Now Saul and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Eli fighting with the Philistines. And David arose early in the morning and left the sheep with a, key, with a keeper and took provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him and came to the encampment. The host was going out to bat the battle line shouting the war cry and Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, the army against army. And David left the things in the charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers and talked with them. Behold, the champion of the Philistines, Goliath of Gath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. He's challenging them. What's Israel do? To make a long story short, they shrink back in fright. Fearful. Fearful of this man. So I want us to look at this as a man after God's own heart. How can you and I develop that heart? David, I want you to notice here, has an eagerness to serve. Okay, leading up to battle... In the previous chapter, which we've skipped over for time's sake, in chapter 16, verse 23, Saul, after the Spirit of God left him, I'm going to begin in verse, um, uh, oh, let's see, let's, let's go down here in verse 23 of that chapter. Uh, Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. David was a servant. David was playing musician uh, music for the king, King Saul. That was the that was where King Saul wanted David to be. David did so. If you look at chapter 17, verse 14 through 15, David is caring for his father's sheep while Saul's in battle. And then down in verse 17, we see David. He's and we just read that a moment ago. David was bringing food. For his brothers encamped at battle. So David has a he has a desire to help others, to serve others. Friends, I think that's a leadership quality right there. Someone who's willing to serve others. I want you to notice David's response to Goliath's taunting. Goliath's taunting is taunting Israel. And David responds to that taunting here by saying, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David responded. David didn't pull back. David didn't power. He says, who are you? Who is this guy that has this much nerve, this much gall? You can see a confidence in his attitude. Okay? It's easy to say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God when you're behind lines? Then notice, I read a little bit ago, verse 32, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David has confidence. And that confidence is not in his own abilities. Remember, this is a shrimpy guy. You were here two weeks ago. He's small. He's not a warrior. He's not trained. He doesn't have proper armor. He doesn't have the, the, uh, the, 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 the machine gun of the day. No, that's not David. He doesn't have all that, and yet he has confidence. He has confidence in God. If you go down here in verse 36 and 37, you'll see what David says. He says, your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, 
will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, the Lord be with you. It's not leadership on Saul's part, but confidence on David's. You see, his confidence was not in his own strength. But his confidence was in the God whose ability he had experienced. Even today, no man wants to go up against a lion. No man wants to go up against a bear. But David had that kind of experience. He had experienced God's power and God's ability working through him. You notice verse 45. He challenges Goliath with these words. You come at me with sword and with spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Friends, when we're facing our giants, whatever that might be in our lives, our giants may control certain aspects and they may have the advantage over us in certain areas of our lives. But come at your giant in the name of the Lord. Come at your giant in the name of the Lord. Come with confidence that God is with you. As I said before, David might not have been the most qualified individual. In fact, he probably definitely was not the most qualified individual. David was not trained in giant fighting. We're not trained in giant fighting. But that doesn't mean that we don't face those giants. We might not be the most qualified individual to do what it is that we do in the service of the Lord. There might be someone who is much better qualified to stand here this morning than I am. In fact, I know there are. They just don't happen to be here. There might be someone more qualified, and I know there is, to lead us in song. There might be someone more qualified to do whatever it is that you do. But we don't count qualifications that way. We can't count qualifications by having a willingness to do those. David saw what needed to be done. And he did what needed to be done. He knew that if Israel did not stand against Goliath and against the Philistine army, that they would fall and they would fail. When we fail to stand for the truth, when we fail to stand for God, and when we fail to stand against the giants in our own lives, we will fail and we will fall. Think back. You know, World War II, what would have happened if the United States had not taken a stance when Pearl Harbor was bombed? We would have fallen. And the world would not be the same as it is today. Christians must take a stance. Remember, remember this though. I, I want to I want to look at, at this giant for just a moment. I want you to see what David is up against. I want you to see that the, the, these are Bible measurements, so bear with me. I messed the math up the last time. But I want you to think about this. Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits. Now, a cubit is 18 inches. That puts Goliath, it's, it's six cubits in a span, so that puts Goliath at over nine feet tall. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to fight with anybody that's nine feet tall. It would be like, it, it, seriously, it would be like me 
uh, taking maybe maybe Esther over there and getting into a fight with her. That's how unbalanced this fight is. And sometimes that's really how unbalanced our fight is. You know, and just just if we would just do the math on the on the weight of the armor and the weight of his swords, it's incredible. But just to fight someone that's nine feet tall. Now, I don't know what the average height was in that day, but I anticipate the average height was probably somewhere around five feet. So David is fighting a guy twice his height. Goliath wouldn't even fit through the doors of this church building. But yet David says in verse 46 that the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to God. Let's go back here. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 46 says this. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give your dead bodies, this is Goliath, your dead bodies are to the host of the Philistines this day, and to the birds of the air, and to the beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, David's confidence. The battle belongs to God, but it's ours to fight. David had an attitude of victory. And that victory was... I'll wrap that up this morning. We probably could have pulled a lot more interesting facts out of this lesson. But if you get nothing else out of it, rest assured, when we face the challenges that life throws at us, those challenges can and will be overcome. I want to turn to one last passage for thought. It comes from the Philippian letter. Paul's letter to the Philippian Christians. I don't have this on the slide. But in Philippians chapter... Chapter 3. And in verse... Sorry, not chapter 3, chapter 4. Paul says in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly and now rejoice at length. You have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul says, I've learned it all. I've experienced it all. I've experienced life on the high. I've experienced life at the low. This is what he says in verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Can we say we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us? If you care to, you can take out your song books and turn to the song that's been selected. If there's anyone here this morning with needs, I would encourage you to make those notes. Together we sing 700.